All right, here we go. Today we have former undercover DEA agent Louis Diaz, the man largely responsible for busting New York drug kingpin Nikki Barnes and dismantling the commission. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you. Well, it's your first time here. I want to start in the very beginning. So you were born in 1947. Yes. Your parents are from the north Spain. part of Spain. Yes. And uh, you grew up in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Yes. So what was Brooklyn like oh, man. in the 50s and 60s? Brooklyn was beautiful, Matt. I mean, it was the best part of my life. Uh, you have to figure a lot of guys, tough guys, wise guys, they went to the army because they got sentenced there. Okay. Instead of going to the joint, they said, you're going to do two, three years in the army. I was do three years in the joint, right? And there was other guys, when they came out, they got married, okay? And they were part of the community, but in a nice way. But also, guys that came back, they were having kids left and right. Mm -hmm. So Red Hook, my neighborhood, was replete with kids. One block, four apartments, all with kids. 20, 20 houses on the road, four, four, four families. They were all over the street, on the street. It was like, uh, it was wonderful. You know, you play street games all day long. Uh, a lot of camaraderie, a lot of tough things too. We had a, f a lot of fights, you know. That's the way it was growing up in Brooklyn. Was there a mafia presence? Yes, it was, but not too much with us. Uh, I mean, they were known, they did certain things. You know, If you wanted to get liquor, you wanted to see Casamiro, you wanted to get sued, you wanted to see Bobby, things of that sort. Uh, but I knew Joe, and I, I like Joe, matter of fact, Joe Gallo. Okay. Well, age 17, you joined the Army. Correct. You went out to Germany for a while. Correct. Uh, and then you came back in 68? Uh, 64, 66, 66. 66. Okay. You came back, you got married. Correct. And uh, one of the guys in the Genovese family actually attended your wedding. Yes. Okay. So... The mafia presence was somewhat around you yes. during that time. Matter of fact, I can tell you a story about that if you want to know. Sure, go ahead. Uh, when I was a kid, my mom, my mom's gumari, you know what that is, right? Was a Della Capolino, all right? Capolino was a major figure for the ILA International Longshoreman Association. Mm -hmm. She used to send a Cadillac, a limousine to my house to pick us up to take her to a house. I didn't know from nothing then. You know, I didn't know, wow, look at this, you know? And uh, we'd be there. And that was it. But later on, I found out that Capolino was a made guy. He was big, he had about 20 homicides, he got away with everything. Uh, and he was a strong arm for the, for the union. Uh, I found out later on. I didn't really want to know about it before that, especially when I was on the job, because if, uh, if UID got involved with me and put me on, 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 a, on a seat with the lie detector test, I, I, would, I couldn't fail it, you know, because I was telling the truth. I didn't know the guy. I didn't know nothing about it, see? So, uh, yeah, I did know him. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, by 1971, you actually wanted to become a federal drug agent, but you had smoked some weed <laughs> during that time? <laughs> that was, uh, was, I tell you, I met with a guy, uh, this, this fellow was a very good person, Nicky, uh, Louis Gonzalez, he worked for FBI. That's the guy who, who made the frog in the elevator. And he told me, just watch out for this guy. He don't like me, you know? So I went for the interview. Lord, I got I got the guy for the interview, this fucking guy, the same guy. So he told me, what about this, what about that? Did you ever smoke? Oh, yeah, I smoked a joint. That was it. He's One gone. time, I was gone. <laughs> One time. Okay, so first you joined the U.S. EEOC. What's that? The EEOC. Oh, sure, uh, yes, yes. As an yes. investigator first. Yes, exactly, yeah. Okay. Uh, but you had a neighbor who worked for the ATF. Correct. Alcohol, tobacco, and fire. Yes. And then I guess through him, that's how you ended up joining the ATF? That's correct. Okay. It's a beautiful story, by the way. Okay. So now by 72, age 25, you're part of the ATF. Correct. So how, you know, how were those early days like? Well, they kind of used me and my partner, Ray Martinez, like a Toyota. Got a lot of mileage out of us, <laughs> with a little gas, but, uh, we were out there making a lot of cases, a lot of cases, and a lot of the cases were made on cold information without informants. But the name of the game is informants, okay? And uh, we hit the street with a, with, 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 with a fervor, with fire, you know? Uh, and many of the cases that I made in particular were cold cases. There were no informants, there was no intelligence. And basically what I would do is, I went to school in Williamsburg, so I knew it back and forth. I went to Holtz Training High School. 
So I knew the haunts where these people hung out, you know. So what I would do is on the way home, I would stop there for a while, hang around, you know, go into a bar, have a couple of drinks and so forth and so on. But I knew where the tough guys were, where the guys that made trouble were. Mm. So I, I concentrated myself in that area until I made myself known. And then when I got myself known, we went into business. Okay, and weren't you providing like guns to the mob during that time? That was my, that was my story. Okay. That was my cover story. Your cover story. Yeah. Got it. Okay, and then by 75, you actually joined the DEA. Correct. Which is the Drug Enforcement Administration. Yes. And that's where really you got into your stride. Yes. All right, so as you started to join, was the undercover thing, you know, is that how it started or did that kind of, you know, start later on? No, it started almost right away. Okay. Well, I came into the DEA with a reputation and uh, they looked to me to do certain things and I did. Okay. Now, during that time, Nikki Barnes and the council was in full swing in Harlem. So, yes, yeah, so they were, yeah. I didn't know too much about that at that, that time. Okay. At what point did you actually get put on the Nikki Barnes case? Circa, I think, 1976 or so. Okay. So, let's talk about Nikki Barnes for a second. Leroy Nicholas Barnes. Yes. Born in 1933. Uh, you actually call him the Al Capone of Harlem. Yes, I did. Why would you call him that? Because he did a lot of things like that. He had a lot of respect. The main thing is because he had a lot of respect. He was tough, just like I was. And he got shit done. The hard way or the easy way. Okay. And at that point, there was no crack. And no. cocaine was more of like a rich man's drug. Yes. So it was mostly heroin. Yes. Which is really a terrible drug. Yes. Like the kind of stories I hear of people that are hooked on heroin, like women having sex with dogs and yes. just really hideous things yes. in order to get a hit. Yes. Like, what were some of the worst things that you were seeing out there in terms of heroin addicts? Well, they call it the nod. Guys nodding out on the subway, falling into the tracks and get run over. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Basically that, you know, just, just poor human beings. They turn into poor human beings, like, you know, nothing, you know, rags, you know, and they're hanging out in the street. Uh, and then these guys, too, would, would do crimes from time to time. But other than that, that was basically the scene. So in 1972, Nikki Barnes actually formed the council, which is a seven-man African-American organized crime syndicate, which controlled most of the heroin that was actually happening in New York City. Yes. So, of course, it was Nikki Barnes, Joseph Jazz Hayden, yes. Wallace Rice, yes. Thomas Gaps Foreman, yes. Ishmael Muhammad, Correct. Frank James, yes. and Guy Fisher. Yes. And I guess it was actually modeled after the mafia? Yes. Matter of fact, Joe taught him these things. He gave him what to deal with. He gave him the examples and the model of how to deal with that kind of situation. Okay. So explain to me how the council and the mafia was working, the Italian mafia was working together. You know, I don't know that they worked together, but they had mutual sources of supply. Like Maddie Madonna was Nikki's source of supply for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically they shared... They shared dope with one another, one click to another. And sometimes one guy got more dope, he gave it to the other guy. They shared money together. It was really a, a consortium of cooperation and brotherhood. Okay. So the Italian mob and the council were never really at war with each other? No. Okay. No. Okay. And they became like an international drug trafficking ring. Correct. At, at one point. Where was the dope coming from? Like other countries? Well, the Italians got it. It was, uh -huh. it was coming from the Golden Triangle, China uh -huh. White. Okay. Uh -huh. So Italians would bring it in and sell it to the council. Correct. Essentially. So they were- And like, others, of course, for that. And others, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you know about how much, you know, heroin was running through during this time, like on a yearly basis? I tell you, it was multi, hundred, hundreds of kilos, hundreds of kilos yeah. would come in. Okay. And then by 1975, that's when you actually started to work on the Nikki Barnes case Correct. yourself. So tell me how you first really got into that organization and what your cover was. Okay. Do I tell you how I got, got into it? Go ahead. Okay. We were group, group 13. It was a group with seven guys, eight guys and a supervisor. And each one of us was responsible for his own cases. You buddied up with a partner. You did your own case. If you needed support, you got the other guys to deal with your surveillance, so forth and so on. Uh, 
Then there was another group, the conspiracy group in the Southern District of New York, which was headed by Don Farone. And the work that they had to do was they put together all cases, right? And they found out common denominators that didn't know the other guy. So they put them together based on the intelligence they got on who they were and what they did. So they formed one big case and got a lot of people as a result of that. In this particular instance, Ford was an FBI, I believe it was his name, Ford. Ford was an FBI agent. And he came across this guy, Geronimo, right? They wanted him to cooperate with them on the Italian. Geronimo would not, he says, no, I ain't gonna do that. His uncle was a big guy in, with the Lucchese family. So, but he still wanted to cooperate. So he brought him over to the Southern Conspiracy Group with, with Don Farrell. And he laid out what he could do. And, you know, he said, basically I grew up with Wally Fisher. I knew, I know the guys there, so forth and so on. I can get you into that. Don Farrell, the lights went on. He said, I got the guy for you. He brought him over to, to the group. He introduced him to me. And the moment he introduced me to me, I went on fire. I, I knew this guy was on. Because he reminded me of a childhood friend, Mikey Calabito, who went wrong. Matter of fact, they found them in a trash can, one thing, in pieces. But anyway, I was I felt good about it, you know? So we talked, and then I told him, when these guys leave for coffee, me and you wanna talk. So he did, and we talked. And I told him, listen, we're gonna do things this way. I gotta trust you, and you gotta trust me. And if you fuck me, I'll fuck you too, right? So anyway, we did that, and uh, we created a story. I, I had to come up with a story, you my cousin. We said that he was my cousin. So I thought about it and I said, you know what? Let me think about this. And I came up with a background story. And basically I was a, an associate, associate of the mob, but various families. I did different things for them. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Maybe a little whack here and a whack there and money changing, stolen goods, things of that sort. But I got too hot. They were looking at me with a jaw on the side. They think this guy, wait a minute. If he's with them, he's not, he's not with me. So I went down to California to cool out for a couple of years. I got tired of, of, of Surf City, you know? So I came back, and when I came back, I wanted to get back into business. But I wasn't gonna deal with the Italians, they wanted nothing to do with me. Mm. So that's when I met Geronimo, and Geronimo was supposed to be my cousin. So I said, G, I'll call him G, I wanna get back into the business. So G says, I got the guy, which is Wally Fisher, guy from his brother. So we talked about it, he says, I wanna bring you there. So we went to Holland one night, and uh, we drove up in a Cadillac, and it was, I remember there was a barrel, there was a fire coming out of it, you know, winter was fire coming out of it. So Geronimo gets out the car, he starts talking to him, I can see them talking. So he comes over to the car, I get out, I shake hands with him, we start talking. I says, if you are who you are, we're gonna do business together, me and you. And he says, yes, I, we'll, we will, we will. So that started it, that started it. And then from there we did our thing. Okay, so you, you first started with Wally Fisher, Correct. which is Guy Fisher's brother. Correct. Who was part of the commission. Correct. At what point did you actually get close to Nicky Barnes? There was never a time that I talked to him or shook hands with him, but I knew he knew I was around. Matter of fact, there was a time when I was in Harlem River, Morris Garage, doing a deal with Bo Hatcher for half a key, and he was in the office looking straight at me. So when I did the deal, I, I stared back at him, so I knew he knew me, I knew he knew I knew him. So I, I did a deal with Bo Hatcher, I drove the car out with half a kilo in the back seat, and then right in the trunk, and then from there we went on. Okay, and at that point, uh, Nicky Barnes really had a reputation. Absolutely. He was Mr. Untouchable. Absolutely. He was beating multiple cases when he was getting arrested? 13 cases he beat. 13 cases. Yes. What was he being charged with in these various cases? Murder, conspiracy, gambling, narcotics, nothing ever stuck. Okay, did you actually work on any of those cases? No, that was Operation Slick. That was handled by NYPD. Okay. So every time NYPD would arrest him and charge him, he would walk away. Correct. I mean, it's not work away quick, but I mean, he went through the process and he got acquitted. Okay. And was he buying off witnesses or jury members or? Yes, he was. Matter of fact, Guy Fisher was involved with that. Okay. Give me an example of someone he bought off. Well, in the, in the Barnes case itself, I think Guy got to a few people and basically got to them and just brought them off. That's it, basically. That was it. Okay, so the witnesses would go and change their stories and right. when, get on the stand. And, I didn't cooperate with what was going on. Right, and then there's a reasonable doubt. Exactly. He would walk free. Exactly. 13 cases. Yes. Okay. So by 76, uh, this was really a big operation. You know, the council, which had seven members, each of them controlled about a dozen mid-level distributors 
who then in turn had like 40 street level guys. Correct. So hundreds of people are now involved in the council in Correct. one way or another. And I guess Nicky Barnes had a bunch of front companies he to did. try to protect himself. He did. A bunch of car dealerships. Hollering in the garage, yeah. Okay. How did you find out about these things? Or did this come out later? No, we, at the time, Raleigh gave up a lot of stuff. Raleigh was my Trojan horse. <laughs> he pretty much gave up a lot of things. So he was telling you all this stuff? Yeah, and Helen Rivers was one of them. He said, Louis, this is where a lot of stuff goes down. Nicky goes there, a lot of dope comes out of there. We're going to be there one day and do business with him. Uh, but that's the way I got that. But there was another garage, too, Helen Rivers. There was another garage where he kept his Mercedes and big cars and where they were Wally. Uh, but anyway, we got a lot of stuff off, off, off uh, Wally. Right. Uh, the DA eventually found a lot of the cars. There was a Bentley, a Maserati, a Benz, a Volvo, a bunch of Cadillacs, a That's bunch right. of Lincoln Continentals, exactly four right, Thunderbirds. Yeah. Exactly so, right. Like, How many cars did this guy have? About seven or eight. Okay. Matter of fact, when I went Wally, he told me to meet him at this particular garage, and I forget the name of it right now. But anyway, we walked in, and he said, Louie, look at these cars. He pointed it all, and that's Nicky's. I said, wow. You know, I want to meet him one day. You will. And basically what I told Wally, he knew I needed stuff. I said, I want a steady source of supply. I don't want to be running back and forth to different people. You get me to the right people, and we'll do business, right? So he said, you will, and I'll get you to the right people. But they got to be associated with Nicky. He said, they are. And that's where we took off. Right. I mean, on top of the cars, Nicky Barnes had literally hundreds of tailor-made suits and coats and jewelry. Oh, yes, he did. He They're saying that just his clothing and jewelry alone was worth about $7 million. I don't know about that much, but it was expensive, very expensive. Oh. Right. And I guess at his height, he had reached about $50 million? More than that, maybe. More I mean, than that. What he was worth? What, he, what he was worth, yeah. I'd say about $30 million. Okay. And he became the biggest drug lord in Harlem. Yes, he was. Okay. And I guess he knew he was under surveillance. So oh, I guess he would basically run well, DEA agents. and He was great at it. He was very good at what he did. <laughs> okay. So what kind of stuff would he do to try to evade? Well, he, he'd run into a garage and he knew that they had an exit. So he'd run into the garage, take another car and run out the back with the car. Or he would speed down the street, stop quick, make a right turn quick and things of that sort. Okay. And in order to really keep the drug empire going, the council had a bunch of contract killers, like uh, Robert Young, a.k.a. Willie Sanchez. Yes. How many murders were occurring around the council during that time? There was about 20 that I knew of. 20 murders. Give an example of why someone would get killed. Well, basically because they turned out to be snitches, or they thought they were a snitch, or they were robbing dope, or they were robbing money. Those are the three big factors. Okay. Were the people that were getting killed for, snitch for snitching, were they actual snitches? Some of them were, yes. Okay. And they were working with the DEA? Not at that time. No, they were just snitching to other groups. Ah. You know? And some of them were with the DEA. Uh-huh. Some of them were. Or with the police, actually. Not so much with the DEA, because we would have jumped on them, you know? Well, on June 5th, 1977, New York Times Magazine were about to release an article about Nikki Barnes and they're going to call it Mr. Untouchable. Now, before running the actual article, they told Barnes that they were going to use a mugshot for the cover. Right. And if they didn't want him to use the mugshot, they could do a photo shoot. Correct. And with that became sort of the worst mistake of his career. Correct. So he actually did a whole photo shoot where he's on the cover with his glasses Correct. and his fancy Italian suit. Correct. And there's a whole photo shoot. Where I think he's in front of the court building. Yes, he is. And this cover was such a big deal that the president of the, of the United States, Jimmy Carter, got infuriated when yes, he, he actually saw yes, it. Yes, he did. Tell me about what happened with the whole Jimmy Carter thing. Well, when Carter saw the article and saw the picture, when he got back to the White House, he called Griffin Bell right away, the United States attorney, United States attorney. And he told Griffin Bell to get on it. Griffin Bell in turn called Robert Fisk of Southern District of New York. And he put heat on Robert. You gotta get this guy. Uh, and that's where we started. And then we, when he got to be locked up, we brought him in and we started the case, uh, the jury and trial and all that. Okay, when you saw that cover, what'd you think? 
I said, look at this guy, man. He looks good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that looks good. He did look good on that cover, yeah, you sure got to say. I sure did. <laughs> okay. So at that point, were there a bunch of wiretaps that were happening around his case? There was one in particular, yes. Okay. Tell me about that wiretap. Well, that wiretap was in Harlem River Motors Garage, actually. We had a couple of guys that go through the skylight with ropes, almost like commandos. Hmm. And they set the, the, uh, the wires in different places. So we had that going. However, when the case went down, uh, a lot of the wires weren't good. The recordings were, because there was a lot of music, you know, soul music, you know, which, which is another thing that comes up. So a lot of the stuff wasn't, wasn't really usable because of that, that stuff, you know. But that was the main wire, actually, the one that uh, we had in Harlem Middle Most Garage. Okay, and what got caught on that actual wire? One thing only. Get the keys here. One thing only. Get the keys here. Get the keys out of the car. They thought that was kilos, but it actually was the keys to a car. Okay. And that was it. That's all we got, believe it or not. Okay. And at that point, a sweep happened where everyone got arrested. I guess 20 people got arrested? No, it happens later on. Later on. Okay, later on. Yes. Okay. Now, 20 people get arrested. Yes. Including Nikki, including uh, Nikki Barnes. Yes. Now, he was charged with a CCE. Yes, con continuing criminal enterprise. Now, wasn't that a new law? Yes, during it that was time? Out, of, out of RICO. Okay. So so that was before RICO? No, that was part of, part of RICO. Oh, that was part of RICO. Yes. Okay. Now, the, the RICO law originally was used to bust the mafia. Correct. But then it got started using you Correct. Know, for other, other gangs as well. Correct. Uh, explain what a, a RICO is to everyone. Uh, RICO was, a, was, a, was a, a law, if you will, that concentrated on organized crime and it was used as an instrument to get at the source of who they were. And it also provided penalties, severe penalties, for those who got caught and went to court. But it was like really a danger sign for the pop and for other organized crime groups. When they found out Rigo was what it was, they kind of backed off a little bit. Right, because you didn't actually have to be caught doing a crime if they proved the affiliation to right. a criminal enterprise or a gang Absolutely. or a, a, you know, a, a family or whatever. Absolutely. Suddenly you're a part of this. That's right. Basically a conspiracy is, you can mm -hmm. have a conspiracy with three people. It's a meeting of the minds between two or three people to commit a fraud, commit a crime. Mm -hmm. And all you need is one overt act, one overt act to make the conspiracy. You didn't have to act it out, but if you got one overt act, you win for a conspiracy. Okay, now this whole time you're still undercover. Yes. Now your wife doesn't know what you're doing. No. Your kids no. don't know what you're doing. No. How scared are you during this time that Nikki Barnes, who has you know, tens of millions of dollars could just have you followed, could have you looked into, and could probably, I mean, if they just followed you home, they could kind of figure out who you are. Yes. I got to tell you, and I'm not blowing smoke up my ass, okay? But uh, since I grew up in Brooklyn, I knew these guys. And I was in the Army, I was the only non-black on a boxing team. So I, I ran with blacks. I knew who they were. And I wasn't afraid of them. I knew, I knew their background, their story. And I was very fond of them at that time. So uh, when I worked with them, I was really felt comfortable with them. Uh, and that's what made me go forward with these people. They, they liked me and I liked them. Uh, so basically that was that. Was there ever a time where you felt like your cover was about to get blown or you'd be in any level of danger? No, but i tell you what. What I did was, this is another thing. During that period of time, and I, got, I find fault with DEA at that time. It was a very important case, but they weren't, weren't giving me the tools to really further my actions, what I had to do on the cover. I had to come up with everything. I had to reach into my socks and come up with different things. You know, For example, uh, Richard Montero was a boss in, in the gas company. I would tell him, can you provide me with those things they put around the sewer so my surveillance guys could look from there? I had another guy, George Rapol, who was a ILA, International Long Shoreman Association, hard man, big right, right hand man. He gave me a card for us to be a merchant marine, so I had that. Uh, what else did I have? I had different things like that that made me get over with them, you know? Uh, what was the question again, I'm sorry. No, you, you answered it, you okay. answered it, in terms of getting caught and, and oh, worried. Yeah, so, and then another thing was, when I went home, I never went home the same way, never. Mm. And what I did was, I switched cars. I, I went to the uh, motor, motor pool. That's another thing, I had to fight to get another car. I couldn't get it through the, through the job, you know, through channels. I said, fuck this, I'll do what I gotta do. So I seen George Manny, he was in charge of the garage. He said, George, 
do, do me a favor. You got a car that I could use? Because the seized cars were brought down there. Seized cars. And the seized cars eventually would be part of the government. It was seized. So you got a car that I could use? Said, yeah, this one. And well, I took it out and I used it. And I would park it in a certain place. And when I got home, I parked the car in a certain place. And I'd take the other car and I'd go home. Okay, well, there was a situation in 1978 when you were hanging out with Wally Fisher, Guy Fisher's brother, and something went wrong. Correct. Tell me about this. Well, we were riding around with Geronimo looking for people, guys that were set up to do a deal with me. So on one of these passages, one of these routes, I took, the radio went off, and I could hear the communications between my group who were following me. So I went crazy. I what the fuck? Hey, G, what's going on? Get out of the fucking car, Wally and G. If you're fucking Wally, you're dead. I put him up against the wall, my gun. I, 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 flat, flat up, I searched him. And then G turned around and said, Louie, what are you doing? It happens all the time. You know, you pick up, pick up police talk on a, on a radio. Sometimes it comes through. So I let him calm me down. I went in the car. We took off. Okay, even though it was your radio. Yeah, my radio. That radio. actually went off. Yeah. So Wally Fisher did not think that anything was wrong with no, this? No, 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 no. Like I got out of it, you know? Because Geronimo helped out too. He says, you know how it is? Sometimes that happens. You're in a car or you have your radio and you get uh, you get uh, verbiage from other sources. Which doesn't actually happen. Huh? I mean, that doesn't actually happen in real life. Well, it does. Does it? It happened to me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then in 1978, Nikki Barnes has been arrested. Correct. And... They start the federal trial. And this is the first trial where there's actually an anonymous jury. Correct. What was the reason for the anonymous jury? Well, because of the history of Nicky Barnes and his people. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't want no leaks. It was a tough case, a big principal case. So you want to safeguard the case and the integrity of, of the whole, their whole situation. Okay. Outside of the CCE, what exactly was Nicky Barnes charged with? CCE, possession, distribution. Possession and distribution, basically. Okay, so no murders or anything else like no, that? No, no, no murders. Okay, and at that point, did you actually have to step forward and basically make yourself known that you're a, yes. you know undercover DEA yes. agent? Yes, yes. Okay, and now you weren't dealing directly with Nikki Barnes, but you were dealing with the commission. Correct. So you were dealing with Wally Fisher. Correct. Guy Fisher as well? Correct. Okay. No, I wasn't on trial, Guy, then. Uh, okay. He was on another charge. Uh, okay. But now, suddenly, you have to break your cover Correct. and make yourself known. Correct. When people found out that they'd been buying drugs from a, a DEA agent, and how, how much drugs did you purchase during that time? About three kilos of heroin. Three kilos of heroin. Okay. When it was found out that they'd been dealing drugs to the authorities, what kind of shockwave? I can imagine, man. You know, <laughs> earthquake, man. Major earthquake. Okay. Uh, no, he was startled. As a matter of fact, I met Nikki in the hallway one time, and I said to Nikki, Nikki, I'm only doing my job, you know? I know, don't worry about it. He said, don't worry yeah, about it. Yeah, do what you gotta do, yeah? We're okay. very nice about it. How long did this trial actually last? From what I remember, about three months, maybe? Two or three months? Three months, so it was a yeah, long trial. Yeah, it was a long trial. Okay, now this trial here, uh, Jazz was actually one of the figures yes, in this he trial. Was. He was part of the commission as well. Yes, he was. So what was his role in this case? Well, he was Nikki's right-hand man. Since Guy got arrested, he became Nikki's right-hand man. And he, he provided uh, a, a, con, a, a, a front, which was Jacazzi's Club 83, okay? And uh, he owned it. And basically, he had gambling uh, parlors. He had drinks. He, he had a restaurant. And that was a front for him. But he actually worked it. You know, he actually worked it. He got a living out of that. Okay. So after beating all of these cases, Nikki Barnes actually got convicted. Yes. Life without the possibility of parole. Yes. On January 19th, 1978. Yes. Did you actually take the stand in this trial? Yes, I did. Okay. And what exactly did you talk about when you took the stand? I, I was on the stand probably for about a week or two. Okay. And I testified to everything I did from morning to afternoon. Okay. And what you did, I mean, you talked about the three kilos of, of heroin. Everything, everything, conversations that I had. What was more important, uh, in addition to the, the purchases, was the conversations and the meetings that I had with these people, key people. Because what what one per person did was, was 
we charge to another, you could you could use it as evidence in the, in the conspiracy over here, things of that sort, meetings, things of that sort. So a lot of it was based on intelligence that I got in addition to to getting the dope, buying the dope. Okay, now in this particular case, Nikki Barnes did not cooperate. No. He didn't take a plea deal. No. He didn't snitch on anybody. No. He probably thought that he could beat it. I don't know about that, but he didn't. <laughs> He might have. He might have. I, I don't know. I can't testify to that. Okay. So he gets convicted and he gets life in prison Correct. without parole. Now, Guy Fisher had a different trial, right? Correct. Which ended in a hung jury? Yes. So he got off. Yes. Well, what, what was Guy Fisher facing? Life. About what he was doing. Okay. It's a funny incident, if you will. But after during the course of the trial, they picked me and Bobby, my partner, to trail Nikki. What the fuck, man? Give me a break. Yeah, I'm the undercover on the case, bring the major evidence, and now I got to tail Nikki. Mm -hmm. So we tail Nikki all over the place. And one time we stopped at the light, Nikki gets out of the car. I said, Bobby, get your gun. So Nikki comes up to the window and says, What are you doing to me? He said, I'm going to go here. I'm going to Don't worry about it. Just stay close to me. I'm not going to get in trouble. You know? So on one particular night, I come off a deal on another case. And I end up on the West Side Highway, all right, with Bobby, nervous. So we parked the car, but Nikki was with us. So Nikki parked the car behind us, okay? This way, keep an eye on it. And he went into the hotel. We had other agents there as well. So me and Bobby were talking about, wow, what a case. We're going to get promoted. We're going to get this. We're going to get that, you know? We fell asleep, hmm. okay? And uh, the next thing I know, the sun was hitting in our face. We get up. I'm like, hey, Bobby, what are you doing? The car wasn't there. Hmm. Fuck, what happened, man? So we thought maybe it got towed away or something. You know? But it did. It got towed away. Hmm. So... Uh, I took the car and I sped down to the to the West Side Highway to the place where they towed the car. Went right through the gate. And I hit the guy up with, who took the guy. What are you doing? He said, well, I got to tow the car. So anyway, we went to the, to the uh, whoever it was that was in charge of the stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to pull the car out. He said, no, you can't. This guy owes about $2,000 in fines. So we, we really couldn't get the car because it was under their jurisdiction. So I drove back to the hotel where he was. And I asked the guys where he was because we didn't know at that time. We were still in the room. So he called, they called up and he's still in the room. So he comes out and when he comes out, I tell him, Nikki, I got some bad news and good news. The bad news is they took your car. The good news is I'm gonna take you to court. <laughs> you know? And uh, pretty much that was it for that. Huh? Okay, so the Guy Fisher trial, that happened after Nikki Barnes got convicted? If I'm not mistaken, I think it was during. During? during. Yes, if I'm, okay. if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. Well, Nikki Barnes get put in, gets put in prison Guy Fisher is still on the street. Now, didn't something happen where Guy Fisher tried to take over Nikki's operation? He was looking to. Okay. He was looking to. Uh, when he got out on the street, you know, he, Guy was very smart, man, very smart guy. And uh, Nikki really confided in him a lot, you know? I think he was uh, 26 years old, and Nikki saw a lot in him. He was a really smart guy. And then when he got out of prison, he started to do things. Not major. But he started, he started doing what he had to do until he, he built himself up. Okay. Now, is that the reason why Nicky Barnes started to cooperate? That and many other reasons. He found out that major players in his organization would, would, would have an intercourse with, with a lot of his women. One in particular, uh, she was beautiful. Shamaka or Shema. Anyway, they were doing her. I think Guy was doing her. So uh, Nikki said, this is it, I'm, 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 I'm flipping. I don't care, I'm flipping. These guys, this was a brotherhood. What I do for one man, I do for another. And they fucked me, you know? So I'm gonna get back at them. So he, that's when he flipped, he started talking. Okay, were you surprised that uh, Nikki Barnes started to cooperate? Yes. Okay. Were you involved in the whole cooperation process? No, I was not. Okay, you're, you're completely not. separated from that. Okay, but he did start to cooperate. Yes, he did. And he told on, Everybody. Yes, he did. Uh, I heard there was a $1 million price on his head. Yes, it was. Okay. Um, now, when he took the stand, is that when he like had to wear a mask over That his... was before. That was before. Right. It was in a hearing. I think, I think it was a congressional hearing, but he had a quote on him, yes. Okay. Well, why did he wear a mask over his face? <laughs> I guess he didn't, want to be, he didn't want to be seen who he was. But everyone knew who he was. I know though, exactly. So I don't know. <laughs> He's on the cover of New York I, Magazine. I know, I know, I know. I know. Uh, Maybe it was, I don't know, really. Uh, okay. 
So uh, based on the cooperation and uh, I guess uh, Rudy Giuliani was in charge of that. Yes. They try to reverse his life sentence. Yes. And, and number one, I mean, based on his cooperation, how many people got locked up? Oh, man, I couldn't tell you. Innumerable. There were a lot of people. A lot of people got locked up. I don't know, maybe 20, 30. Okay. Yeah, at least. Okay, so Nikki Barnes cooperates. Up to 30 people get locked up. Is Guy Fisher one of the guys he cooperates against? I believe so. I'll tell you the truth. I'm not sure right now. Okay. So because of his cooperation, he goes from life in prison to 35 years. He let him out. Well, no, but, but he, he got a 35-year sentence. Yes. As opposed to life in prison. Yes. And I guess since he was working in jail for every two months of his sentence, he basically got a month off. Yes. So... In 1998, he gets released from prison. Correct. Now, you're not in contact with him or, or no, anything else I'm like not. that. Uh, did you find out that he was released? Yes. What did you think when he got released? I said, well, I'm in trouble. <laughs> uh, I had mixed feelings about it, really. But I was concerned for myself, really, in case he wanted to, you know, a vendetta or something like that. Okay. I mean, was there money on your head or anything of that sort? Did I know him? No, not with them. Not with them, no. Okay, so he gets out in 1998 and he goes into witness protection. Do you know where he was in witness protection? I want to think about that. No, I, I, I knew, but I don't remember now. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and then he actually dies in 2012. Yes. And he was in witness protection yes. when he died. Yes. But the obituary actually came out in 2019. Correct. Just seven years after his death. About that, yeah. Okay. When you find out that he died, what'd you think? Rest in peace. Yeah? Yeah. No hard feelings? No hard feelings, no. You know, I gotta tell you something. Uh, maybe my view is different from other agents, but um, this is like a gun fight, you know? You go into a fight with another guy where he's good. So you appreciate his talents. You're going up against him, right? But he's a worthy opponent. That's how I felt about these guys. You know, I, this is my business. I'm good at what I do. They were good at what they did. So if I take them down, that's great. I got over. That's important. Okay. Well, then in 1986, you were involved in Operation Pisces. Correct. Tell me about that. Well, God, that was, uh, according to me, the uh, Attorney General at that time, it was the largest, most successful undercover operation in the history of, of law enforcement. And uh, it was elaborate. It was elaborate. We had basically... Morning laundering operations all over the country. I took New York and California. I was picked to be the guy in California, all right? So uh, basically what it was is you just laundered money. They brought you money, you gave it to the bank, and they put it forward to another bank in Miami. However, in my case, I put the money with the dope, which was something that guys weren't doing. I got them in conversation relative to the dope. Because the rest, what? I just got the money, I took it, what? I got them involved with the conversation. And I got them all involved in one another. For example, uh, my first case was Benitez. Uh, he gave me like maybe four hundred thousand dollars to launder. So I did it. Right, I laundered that. Then there was another guy uh, who was it? It was Benitez again, um, five hundred thousand. And then there was uh, uh, Rivera, and it was two other guys. And we did about a million dollars between us. Uh, and then it was Pantalone. We did a million dollars with him and more. We did a couple of million with, between all of them. And then I came up with this rap. The heroin was being cut with kerosene, which is not the real cut that they're supposed to have. It, but basically, they use ether. And that's how you could tell it was cocaine when you smell the ether. Yeah? And they were making people bleed. So I said to Panting Alone, you have a problem with your cocaine that people are bleeding? He says, yeah. So when I got to deal with uh, Lily, whose name was Lily, do you have the same problem with this? Result? Yes, one and one is two, right? And I, I dealt with the other guys the same way. I asked them if they had a problem with the coke, and they said yes, with the heroin, yes. Uh, and then I would ask them if they knew certain people, and they said, yeah, you know Benitez? Yeah, I know Benitez. And, and Pantalon, yes, I know, boom, everybody in the same mix, you know what I mean? There was one particular guy in particular, I met with him in the parking lot, we had something to do, I forget what it was. But his phone was dead, one dead. So I told him, use my phone. 
we was raped because I got the number on the, on the, on the, my phone, the register. So he called, and he called a Chevrolet dealer in Los Angeles. That dealer was a front for them. They provided uh, licenses. They provided them with cover. They provided them with cars. So we got them to involved in the uh, conspiracy. Okay, and you were actually working with the uh, Medellin cartel. Yes. Uh, Jose Lopez and Alfonso Reyes. Yes. Who were close to Pablo Escobar. Yes. Did you ever meet Pablo Escobar? No, I didn't, no. Okay. Did you ever go to Colombia? No. Okay. But the Medellin cartel has quite a fearsome reputation. Yes. Were people getting killed around this, yes. this group of people that you were working <laughs> with? Okay. What were some of the murders that were happening during this time? And there was one in particular. I only could talk about one in particular. Okay. And that, I was dealing with Fonte uh, Leon at that time. We did $2 million together. And we were sitting down in my apartment. We got an apartment to, to uh, further the case. It was easier to get a place to go, you know, conversation, count the money. Mm -hmm. So I was with Fonte Leon and we were talking. I you know, this guy is tough. I'm a tough guy, you know. So we're talking about this and that. So then I asked him, you're not for nothing. Where'd you get all this money? I know you're gonna get it selling shoes. So he says, no, I guess cocaine. I said, how do you know how much you, you, you gotta get back? He said, I know because I get X amount of kilos from Lopez and I, own, I only own X amount of money, which is about 20,000 per kilo. And that's how I get the money to you. So it, it, that was that, right? The next day, okay, he goes out and he kills Gonzalez, this guy, his partner. Wax him in a place with nine millimeter, just wastes him like in The Godfather, right? Because the guy stole a couple of kilos from him and money. And Lopez sanctioned the kill. Mm. And I said, well, I'm dealing with this guy. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, it was really, I, it was, I was shaken up with, with, by that, you know? Well, right. You laundered over $50 million? Yes, I think so. Okay. And then the arrests started eventually happen. Yes. 350 people got arrested? All told. 350 people. Yes. And they seized nine tons of cocaine. Correct and over a hundred million dollars in cash and assets. That's right. Which is the largest undercover drug investigation in the history Correct. of the United States. Correct, according to me, yes. Out of the 350 people who got arrested, how many actually got convicted? You know, I couldn't tell you, but I always say the majority of them did. Because I know in my case, I was the man in Orange County, right? I covered Irvine, I covered Costa Mesa, I covered Newport. I covered a lot of other areas, right? None of those guys, they all took a plea. But I didn't have to go to court and testify. They just copped a plea and went to jail. Okay, so you didn't actually have to take the stand in that no, case? I, no, I didn't. Because everyone's copying pleas. Right. However, however, there was a time that uh, I had an administrator called me to my boss. They wanted me to work on Clarita, who was Pantanello's wife. They wanted to see what I could get from her in terms of evidence, intelligence. So I thought about it, I said, Jesus, man, I tell you, one thing is working on these guys, another thing is working on a woman. I, it went beyond my parameters, okay? It's like, I really didn't want to do it, to be honest with you. Because she had kids, you know? And I would be instrumental in making her go to jail. So I started working on a story in my head, and, and the surveillance agents tailed her, and when they brought her into an, like an AMP, was, uh, you know, one of these stores, uh, so they got her in there, and they told me, she's there. So I said, okay, I got it. So what I was gonna do is, happenstance meeting with her. Like I just meet her when she's coming out of the store. And I did that. She was coming out of the store and I happened to walk by her. Clarita, what are you doing? She said, oh my God, Louie, yes. Okay, how are you, blah, 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 blah. Uh, what's going on? He said, well, I said, oh, my husband is in trouble. What happened? He whacked this guy Gonzalez. She spilled everything out. Didn't we have a good thing going? We had a nice little business, yeah, but things are different now. Can't we have something between us? No. Behind that, she was locked up. And uh, she was taken in. And I remember, I didn't actually testify. I think she copped the plea. But I was in a room with her kid and the kid that was son of Gonzalez who was killed. And uh, I was saying, wow, look at this. And two kids here. And they liked one another. They were playing to one another. And what a shame. And what a shame. Listen. Anyway, they convicted her on the plea, you know. But I got to tell you, I wasn't very happy doing that. It was beyond my parameters. Mm. Because uh, one thing is to fuck with these guys, you know? Another thing is to, to fuck with their wives. And you, they, they could take that personally. They could take that personally. I was concerned about that. 
Uh, and then the other thing was she had kids too, you know? Mm -hmm. and that's gonna be a problem too for her, you know? I, I was always concerned for that, you know? But I said, you know what? These people kill people, they're, they're selling dope and killing people. I gotta do what I gotta do. And that's what I did. Okay, so then in 1988, you were involved in Operation Blast Furnace. Correct. In Bolivia. Correct. So tell me about this. Well, uh, it was the first time in, in law enforcement history that a law enforcement entity worked with another entity uh, in a foreign country. So we were supposed to work with the uh, Bolivian authorities, which is what we did. And then when it came to me, my boy said, Lou, they want you on the case. I said, what are you doing? I'm doing Pisces. I'm an important part of Pisces. They want you, but they need you to go there to do what you got to do, how you do it. I, at first I balked. I really didn't want to do it, you know. And then I, I gave in. Because I, I, I always did cooperate. You know, I, I, you gave me something, I did it, you know. So anyway, the first thing I did was get shots. I got shot, malaria, polio, yellow fever. That night I had the symptom of all those diseases, <laughs> right? So uh, a couple of days later, I left, I left for the airport. We went to Panama. From there, we went to Bolivia. I got off, when I got off the plane, boom, I hear boots marching, boom, 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 boom. I look up, there's a whole squad of guys, army guys. I said, holy shit, what's this? The officer came up to me, he says, you Diaz? I said, yes, come with me. Oh man, I'll tell you what, this don't look good. So he took me to the uh, embassy where the uh, my guys were, and I went in there and he told me what, I have, what, what was going on. So I, I got briefed. And the fact was, they were gonna go after the cocaine laboratories. So I was taken to, where was I taken to? Trinidad. It was a base outside of the Benny, and uh, and uh, there was two jungles. One of them was the Benny, and what was the other one? I forget. But anyway, we flew flights into that area looking for clandestine laboratories. And it wasn't too hard either because they all had a signature. Heavy heavy trees, water, and a landing strip. <laughs> so one and one is two, right? So we took coordinates and what have you, brought them back to the base. And then the next day, we would go out with the helicopters. They were combat air wing, actually, with Blackhawks. We'd go out with them and hit the sites, all right? And then we would, we'd take whoever was there prisoner. But actually, most of the time, there wasn't anybody. They were bandit, okay? We found out later that this guy, Linares, a, co a colonel with the, with the police, Umapar, was giving shit up. Mm, so he was warning about yeah. the raids. Yeah, he was, yeah. So we took care of him, and uh, that was that with that. But uh, basically, it was basically that to find out where these labs were, destroy them, okay? And basically that was the job. Get up in the morning, do my business, get on a plane, do the flights, get back, give the information, then a black horse take off, we do our mission. There was one situation, however, I gotta tell you, I, I never, I wasn't gonna write a book, no shots fired, okay? Because I never really used my gun in any case. But in Bolivia, in this particular case, when we hit the ground, I felt something, I didn't feel right. I said, something's going wrong here. My knees started to shake. And I, I got myself scared. I never was scared before, but I got myself, I started thinking about what could go wrong and I put fear into myself, right? So I got out of it, I shook it off and we approached the uh, the base, the shots rang out. So I hit the ground, boom, all the guys hit the ground, right? I kept get, getting hit, boom, the dirt was flying all around me. I just started a bit. I got my uh, M16, I got up and I went crazy. Bop, 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 bop. And uh, that was it. We all came up, we, we merged on the, on the base and uh, the guys were gone. I saw some blood. I don't know if I hit anybody, but they took off. And that was it with that. Right. You went on 26 missions. Yes. Uh, how many labs did you guys blow up? About eight. Eight labs. Yes. Now, this is the first time in a foreign country that you're actually operating? Correct. So this is different than being in America. You Excuse know, me? This is much different than being in America. Oh, yes, of course. You know, you got a lot more corruption out there. Yeah. People, like you said, like one of the major military guys was actually being bought off and was, was actually working with the, Correct. With the cartels. Yes. Number one, why why even involve the DEA in Bolivia? Why not let Bolivia handle its own problems? Well, because they, they really were at odds to, to handle that situation. We had the, the means uh, to really get them. We had the manpower. We had the relationship with the combat air wing out of Panama. So we were able to further their investigations and make them square, keep them honest. Mm. So basically, that was the situation. Okay. Do you feel like your life was more in danger over there than yes. it was? Yes. Okay. Yes, I did. But ultimately, everything worked out. Yes. Now, wasn't there a hit on you at some point? Yes. By who? Castellano. Paul Castellano. Yeah. And his people. Okay. Paul Castellano was head of which family? Uh, Gambino, I believe. Gambino. Okay. What was that over? A heroin deal. 
they thought I was an informant. Which you were. I was. No, I wasn't. Uh, so I had to square them away, you know, because they get whacked if you're an informant. So I went back to my neighborhood. This is another story, but, you know, uh, Perky was a made, made guy, but he, he was a friend of mine, and he liked me, and I liked him. We used to hang out on the corner, right? Uh, Warren Street and Henry. We, you know, with the candy stores, drug stores, ice cream parlors, that was our place. We used to hang out there. Perky used to pass by at the corner, and he would see me, and he give me some punches. We'd work out together, give me noogies, you know? Mm -hmm. And then he went on his way. Uh, he liked me. So uh, I knew him very well, you know? As a matter of fact, he, talk, he, talk me, he took me to see Joe Gallo one day. Uh, that was another story. So anyway, he says, Perky, this is a situation, man. I got this contract out on me because of this, that, and the other. He said, don't worry about it. He took me to Todd Hill to meet Castellano. When I met him, I said, listen, sir, this is who I am. I took my, my badge and my shield out. This is who I am. No fucking informant. I'm an agent. So Castellano took my, meal, my shield and looked at him. They flipped it like they do on a job, you know, like De Niro did in this uh, midnight run. They took it and he did it like this. So that was it. I walked out of there. I, I was done. So he was okay with you being a DEA agent? Yes. But not an informant? Exactly. Okay. I did my job. That's what I'm sworn to do. Got it. So the hit was off. Yes. At that point. Okay. And being in the agency this long, didn't it kind of stem from your your relationship with your dad? Well, there was there was a certain there's a lot to do with my dad. Okay, so explain your relationship with your dad. Well, my, my dad was very heavy handed with me. But he was my idol. He was my role model. He was a great man. He was a tough guy. I see my father beat the shit out of a couple of guys. So I kind of, wow, look at this guy, you know? I tell him, beat him good too, you know? So, you know, those days uh, when your father was tough, you, had, you were proud of your father, you know? And I was, that was the way he was in the street. Not so much book work, but muscle work, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, father was a tough guy, man. He was blonde, about 5'10, strong as he could be. He shoveled coal from the Union of South Africa to New York. Uh, uh, he did a lot of other jobs, too. So, uh, but anyway, he, he was tough for me, but I idolized him. But I never got recognition from him. He never really recognized me for anything. I would go to school, get good, good grades. I come on, Papa, look at this. And he said, okay. Give me a slap in the face, like that's what they used to do. You know? Instead of kissing me, he give me a slap. You know? So uh, as time went on, that's the way it was. But when I got on the job, I was, I was always, looking for that stage to, to, to perform. And in my performance, it was really relative to my dad to show him that, you know, Pop, this is what I can do. This is what I did. Right, and your dad actually went to prison himself. In Franco's Spanish Civil War, he fought with the loyalists, the Republic against Franco's forces. He got caught the first year we was fighting. He was caught on the front. They took him as a prisoner, and they took him to a concentration camp. For uh, four years? Four years, yeah. Okay. So in 1990, you actually met Ori Spado, which before, coincidentally yeah. is who brought you here to the center. Yeah, I've seen him before. We met before. Exactly. Now, he was a mobster during that time. I understand that he was, yes. Okay. How did that meeting go? Well, I had a very good friend who was a cop, and we did a lot of things together, Duke Schroeder. And Duke told me, you know, that he had, he, Ori Spado was out here. He told me to, to hook up with him. He's a good guy. So Duke asked me, and I, and I love Duke. We were, we were fighting together. We were boxers. So we sparred together. We fought in the police Olympics together. And uh, I said, okay, dude, I will. I will." I forget how and where I met, but I, we, I met Ori. There came a time where I met him. I believe he came into Maddie's on uh, Melrose. And Maddie was uh, Tony Danza's brother. And he had this, the, the, the restaurant. It was great, by the way, okay? So I was there, and Ori came in, and we met. We had dinner together. I said, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more. And from there on, we got to meet each other. We had dinner together. And then one time he brought me to the apartment. And actually, he was interested in my story. Said, we got to have this story made. And we went on with that until I retired. Hmm. Uh, however, I got to tell Ori to say, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure about Ori at that time. I wasn't sure if he was going to use me for to a, a spy or an agent or an undercover guy for him against the, the bureau, you know? Uh, but then I found out, no, he wasn't, you know, that wasn't true. Yeah, now you guys are friends, yes, I, <laughs> years I, I, later. I really like the guy a lot, man, the good people. I've seen him on your interviews. Yeah, absolutely. He's very unique, his accent, his way he talks, very unique. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, by 1996, uh, age 50, you decided to leave the DEA. Yes. Was there a reason? Yes, 
basically because it's not tell you why. They kind of screwed me in a way, you know. I, up at this point, I had no no complaints with the other than they didn't provide me with the necessary tools to do my job. But uh, there was a written understanding that after four or five years as an agent, as a supervisor, they were sending me back to Washington, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, my four or five years were up, and they came down to send me to Washington, and I didn't want to go. Actually, I had my family, I had other plans. I wanted to really go into acting full time. So uh, I put in my papers to retire, and I did. Okay. And then a year later, your wife passed away. Yes. I guess she had a stroke while she was driving, which led to an accident. Yes. And so forth. How hard was that to deal with? I'm still dealing with that. Mm. Sorry uh, for your loss. She was a wonderful person. She was incredible. She was a beautiful person. Matter of fact, I was telling uh, Dave, such a pure, beautiful person. I was, I was afraid that was sexual. You know? She was like a saint, you know? But uh, she was a beautiful person, a great person. And uh, when she went, it was like all of a sudden, we, I retired so that we'd go on a trip, I'd sell the house and go on vacation, you know? And uh, one day in the morning, she got up and she had a tr uh, terrible headache. So I, I said, what's the matter, honey? I got this terrible headache. And she had him a couple of times. So we got to get checked out. So I brought her to the emergency room. And uh, I explained to him what was going on. And he said, ah, she's just worried about different things. You know, you're retired. She's worried about her son. And uh, it, we left. And then we went to another doctor for a CAT scan. Uh, and then she was home with me that day. Her sister came over with, the, with my brother-in-law. They were at the table. And she passed out on that table. I called the ambulance. They came. They took us to the hospital. She was in bed. She never woke up. They took her to the uh, operation. And uh, I went home, the doctor came out and said, the operation was a success. I said, well, I'm wonderful. And there was about two, 20 or 30 people there. They loved her, you know, she was really well known and very loved, you know? And uh, I went home. About five o'clock in the morning, I got a call. Come to the hospital, it's not so good. So I went, and there she was, lying there. I said, she's brain dead. I have said. You know, she's brain dead. You can't do nothing about that? No. So I stood by her side until they pulled the plug. And uh, that was it. And then I went home and I, for two years I was com completely ruined, way out. You know, I was withdrawn. Uh, matter of fact, I had close friends that come over to the house and talk to me. I said, you know, I gotta leave. I'm not up to it, you know? And uh, then there came a time that my daughter, Maria, she said, Papa, why don't you go to Spain and meet some of your relatives? Because I had a lot of mileage, you know? So I did. I went to, I went to, to Madrid to meet my cousin. My cousin took me to a place called Cucum. Uh, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult name. But I went there, I, I suppose that's where El Cid took off to reconquer Spain and Palayo too. And also there was, it was a story about the Virgin Mary appearing and, and the waters flowed from the mountain where she was. I said, I want to go up there. So I went up and I drank from the waters. And when I came down, my cousin told me, whoever drinks from those waters will find love within a year. So I go home, right? I, I, I wanted to get, I wanted to find an Italian-American, Spanish-American, Italian-American, Puerto Rican-American, Jewish-American from New York. It had to be from New York, right? But that didn't happen. So I called the Spanish embassy, uh, uh, yeah. I asked them if there was any organization that was packaged and what happened to get together, and they told me. So I joined, and I went to different places, but I was always a third man out. You know, everybody came, you know, uh, with, their, with their couples. So the last one I went to San Diego, I wasn't gonna go, but I did. I called my, my brother, my man, Ray the Angel, he said, Ray, I'm gonna stay over there, okay, I'll stay with you, yes. While I was there, I was dancing with somebody, and all of a sudden, I see this entourage of people walking by, but I, that was on top of us, right? And I see this girl. It was like, I got hit with a thunderbolt, you know? I said, wow, look at this. So anyway, I stopped dancing. I went to find her. I was sitting down. I, I talked to her. I told her everything within a half hour. What, you, what, you, what was going on? She gave me her number. I went to Vegas to see a friend of mine. And while I was there, she called me. I went to meet her. We went out for about a year. You know, I was going back and forth. Then finally, she decided to live with me. And the rest of the we got married within two years. Congrats. Yeah. Congrats. Now, some years before that, you had met uh, Paul Servino. Yes. Who was probably most known for... Uh, his role in the, in the Goodfellas. Yes. yes. Uh, 
and you actually started to pursue acting. Yes. Let me tell you about that, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Go ahead. I was with EA at the time, and I saw these cameras and lights, and the whole cell that was right next to us, the Bonaventure was right next to us. I said, wow, yeah. I was always, uh, uh, how do you say, lit up with lights, you know what I mean? I, I was attracted to the action. So I went over, and I see that it was, they were filming. I said, let me get in there. So I, I got a newspaper, and I put it on my arm, and I walked in. That was my MO, too. You, you go in, you, you walk, you get in there like you own the place, you know? So I walked in, and I see Paul Savino sitting down. So I go, oh, Jesus, look at him. So I went up to him. This is my other MO. Paulie, how you doing, Paulie? So they don't want to say they don't know you get embarrassed. Oh, yeah, how you doing? I said, Paul, Jesus Christ, how you doing? What are you doing? We're doing a series, uh, something about a cop, a uh, rookie cop, the youngest cop. And there was a guy there, Wood, of Vinny. And I started talking. He says, what are you doing? Who are you? I, said, I told him who I was. He said, I'm from Rental Brooklyn. So am I. So he started telling me who he was and what happened. So then from there, we went out that night, and uh, we hung out. And from there, it was, was history. He introduced me to a couple of people. We went to a certain place uh, every Wednesday, and then a lot of actors would come there. And uh, one, one, one night, Robert Foster may rest in peace. He was there that one night. He says, Louis, come over here. I want you to meet a director here. Uh, Lustig, whose name was Lustig. So he introduced me to Lustig. And Lustig tells me, you know what? I want you to come out. I want you to, I want you to act in a picture, man. <laughs> Many had cop for a picture. So I went for the audition. And I memorized, I didn't know much about that, but I memorized my lines and I memorized the lines of the other guy. So when I went to do the part, I mean, I know all this stuff. I said, I memorized it, you know? So uh, Robin Davy was there. He said, I want this guy. So they gave me the part and I, and I played it. I did it with Robin Davy. And from there, I got my union card, the SAG card, and the rest is history. Yeah, you were in a bunch of uh, TV shows and movies, uh, Land's End, NYPD Blue, yes. Pretender, Las Vegas, yes. Fairly Legal, VIP, Robbery Homicide, yes. Time of Your Life, LA Heat, Arliss. Uh, Kingpin, Sabrina, yeah. Dangerous Waters, Down and Dirty, Ripple. Yeah. Uh, bunch of stuff. Yes. Bunch of stuff. Yes. Did you miss law enforcement after that or no? No. That was it. Uh, that was it. And people ask me, what do you think about this? You know, this is the only place I could live and get stay alive. Do, do a, a job as a bad guy or a good guy and stay alive. Not, not be threatened by what could happen to me. You know? <laughs> there you have it. Well, uh, Louis Diaz, uh, quite a career. Yes, sir. Quite a career. Uh, you put in a lot of work yes, sir. Uh, for this country. Yes, sir. Stopped a lot of drugs yes, sir. from from being uh, transported and used and probably stopped a lot of deaths and overdoses and everything so. else like I that. I think so, sure. I mean, when you look at what's going on today, you know, it seems like the drugs get stopped, but, you know, temporarily, but there's always a new... Absolutely. A new stream that comes in, and now yeah. fentanyl is becoming yes. sort of the dominant form. Correct. I think there was over 100,000 overdoses this yes. year alone. Right. Uh, and, you know, the narco wars are happening over that. Yes. I mean, do you think that there'll ever really be a change, or do you think that people just like doing drugs? And No, it's come to go stay with us. I mean, what we can do basically is what we did is establish like a dike to prevent the United States to get overloaded with drugs. So we can only stop them to a degree, but you're not going to stop. You're not going to stop the drugs. No as long as people are people and they have problems emotional or they have problems with their head and they need a release, just like with alcohol, mm -hmm. it's going to be drugs. It's going to be drugs. I mean, do you feel that legalization, you know, for example, marijuana was illegal during most of your life. Correct. And now when you look at half the country, Correct. it's legal. Like we're, we're right here in LA, we can go down the street, yes. literally walking distance and yes. buy all the marijuana. Yes. <laughs> We can hold. Yes. Uh, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? A good thing. For marijuana? Yes. But what about other drugs? No. 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 I don't think so, no. Okay. So you don't think that cocaine or anything like no. that should be? No, I don't think so. Well, Louis Diaz, appreciate you sharing your story. Thank you. Quite a, quite a tale. Thank you for having me. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Peace. Thank you.